Uh, this morning, of course, as we finished up Vacation Bible School, and uh, even for your pastor this week, the whole theme uh, around our Vacation Bible School this week uh, really spoke to me, and that's kind of where the message comes from this morning, because the actual, our motto this week for Vacation Bible School was facing fears and trusting God. And of course, as we uh, went through that this week, you know, I got to thinking about, you know, we all have faced fears in our life. We've all been afraid of something in our life. But how does that connect up with our faith in God, following Jesus Christ, and trusting God? There's an example of a little boy one summer evening, of course, during a severe thunderstorm. And, of course, we've had a good many of those lately. We're unable to do our little water time uh, Friday night because the lightning, I walked out one time, the lightning was just streaking all across the sky. But this little boy, of course, there was one summer night, bad thunderstorm, and his mom was tucking him into bed. I know many of you probably had that experience before. And she was just about to turn out the light, and the little boy asked his mom in a trembling, you know, fearful voice, Mommy, will you stay with me tonight? Well, smiling, his mom just gives him this warm, reassuring hug, and she says, I can't. I have to go and, and stay in Daddy's room tonight. Well, after a long silence and a few minutes, finally the little boy mutters under his breath, the big sissy. <laughs> But you know, there are a lot of things that we face in life that we're scared of or that we're fearful of. And I had the opportunity to speak Monday night to our young people, and, and I asked them, do they see any difference, or what is the difference between just being scared of something and being fearful of something? And of course, the main difference is when we're scared of something, usually it's a spur of the moment thing, and we're scared for the instant, and we just kind of get over it. But to be fearful of something is something that we deal with for at least a period of time, sometimes a long time. Sometimes those fears we never ever get over. You know, and, and of course, it's what we call phobia. Here, here's just some of the examples of those phobias. You've got cyberphobia, fear of computers. Sometimes I have that myself, as much as I do with computers. you got lunophobia. That's the fear of the moon. Astrophobia, fear of lightning. Some of you may have had to deal with that in the last few days. Uh, chromatophobia, that's the fear of money. I don't know how many actually have that fear. <laughs> Fear of not enough money is probably more the fear. Europhobia. That's not the fear of Europeans. That's actually the fear of the color red. Um, homilophobia. You know what a homily is? That's a fear of sermons. Some of you may have that one too. Ecclesiophobia. That's the fear of church. You think, how ridiculous is that? Some people do. They're afraid to come into a church because they're afraid of what they might hear or what they might experience. Some of them might just be afraid they might like it. You've got tridesca... Well, let me try this one again. Triscadecophobia. Ooh, that's hard. That's fear of the number 13. Pilotophobia, that's fear of baldness. Some of you are way past that fear. Long time ago. <laughs> Phobophobia. That's the fear of fear itself. But our theme verse this week, and it's such a great verse, Paul writes to Timothy. You know, Timothy was like a student of Paul. Paul was such an encourager, a father figure to Timothy. But in 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of fearfulness, but a spirit of power, of love and of self-discipline. Here he was trying to encourage Timothy because Timothy here as, as a young man has really kind of accepted the responsibility of kind of being an overseer of one of the early Christian churches. And Paul says there's nothing to fear. God has not given you a spirit of fearfulness. 
But He's given you a spirit of power. He's given you a spirit of love. He's given you a spirit of self-discipline. Other translations say He's given you a spirit of sound judgment. And I want us to look at this morning in the 8th chapter of Matthew, if you'd like to turn there, some examples. I want us to look at, first of all, faith. Faith leading to following. And then following to fear. There's a kind of a progression there. And how are those three things kind of interconnected with each other? So beginning in Matthew chapter 8, the first example here, beginning in the first verse, it says, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, there were large crowds that followed him. And a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cured of his leprosy. And then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Here we see a man with leprosy. Not told how long he's had the condition. But in Jesus' time, leprosy was not a good illness, not a good disease to come up with. Because once you have been diagnosed with leprosy, and in many cases, just about any skin condition was referred to as leprosy. But then there was the condition that was just so debilitating. It was so disfiguring. So grotesque. But if you were considered a leper, you were ostracized. You could not associate with anybody. If you were a Jew and a devout or a religious Jew, you were not allowed to go to the temple to even worship. As a matter of fact, you had to walk through the streets. And as you walked through the streets, you had to cry out. In just in a humiliating way, unclean, unclean, which as you can imagine was just absolutely embarrassing, humiliating, disgraceful, and people at all costs would just completely avoid having anything to do with you because they felt like because of some sin, you've come down with lepers. And a lot of times during Jesus' day, any sickness was associated with some type of sin in your life. And so people didn't want to deal with sin. They didn't want to deal with a sinful person. And so you were avoided. You were ostracized. And so this leper really makes a bold step coming to Jesus Christ. A G. And it could very well be the case that this leper, he wasn't real sure how Jesus was going to accept him. If Jesus was going to be like all the other Jewish religious leaders and reject him, or what Jesus was going to do. But he comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. The amazing thing about this leper is that he knows the Lord has the power. He knows the Lord has compassion and mercy. Maybe he's heard the stories. Maybe he's witnessed it firsthand. He knows that the Lord works all things together for our good. You see, ultimately, this leper, regardless of his condition, I mean, he could have come to Jesus and he says, Lord, I've been dealing with this disease for so long. I'm just miserable. Nobody loves me. Nobody wants to have anything to do with me. Nobody cares about me. God, please heal me. But notice right off the bat, this leper's desire, regardless of condition, regardless of how long he's had it, his desire is to have his Lord's desire, his Lord's heart. Because he says, if you are willing... It's just as if the psalmist said, I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is in my heart. Just as Jesus said shortly before he was crucified, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, what faith this leper had. He knew what God could do. But his faith was leaning on whatever the Lord's heart and plan and purpose was for his life. Even if it meant remaining a leper for the rest of his life. Lord, if you are willing, 
Look at verse 5 in Matthew chapter 8. It says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. And Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. You know, it's almost as if Jesus is making that statement as like a test of this centurion's faith. And listen to the rest. And this is why I say that. It says the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I tell this one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And so when Jesus heard this, he was astonished. And he said to those following him, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Now remember, this was a Roman centurion. A Gentile, a non-Jew. And remember, Romans and Jewish people, they certainly didn't have the best of relationships. The Romans were oppressive to the Jews. The Jews hated the Romans because of their oppression. There were many attempts to try to overthrow Roman rule among the Jews, only for them just to be slaughtered and many, many killed. So there wasn't good feelings between the two. But this Roman centurion, humbling himself, comes to Jesus, a Jew, with this request. My servant is sick. He's paralyzed. Lord, please heal him. Now, the interesting thing about this passage is, we're not really told specifically of the centurion's feelings or attitude towards his servant. He could have legitimately really had compassion and mercy and felt burdened for this servant who was ill, who was paralyzed. Or it could have been that he couldn't do without the servant. It was out of need, out of necessity. And he couldn't do without the servant. But either way, he humbles himself, a Roman, a Gentile, coming to Jesus, a Jew, and says, please heal my servant. And Jesus, right off the bat, says, okay, I will come to your house. I will go and I will heal him. Now, you know, Jesus being God, he knows our hearts and he knows all things, right? That's why I said earlier, I believe Jesus was saying this in a in a sense, is testing the centurion's faith. How strong was his faith? And we see that evident in the next reply because he says, Lord, I am unworthy for you to even come under my roof. I am unworthy for you to even associate in my household with me and with my family. And he says, Lord, all you got to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. You see this Roman centurion he certainly knows Jesus' power. And he knows the power in Jesus' very words. And then Jesus says in verse 10, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. It's almost kind of like Jesus is knocking his own people, his own culture. But it was true. This is a true statement by Jesus. He is basically saying this Gentile, this non-Jew, who technically is not considered one of God's chosen people, he's got greater faith than the people God chose, than Jesus' own people. So it's kind of knocking to the Jewish people. But I think Jesus is trying to get a point across to these people. It's almost kind of like as Jesus, as Jesus is saying to these Jews, and he is saying, if you only had the faith that this Gentile has, what a great work, great thing God could do in your life. But you can almost hear the joy in Jesus' voice when he makes that statement. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. The joy in his voice for this centurion's faith, the favor in his voice for the centurion. But right here is a perfect example. Before Jesus' death on the cross, before his resurrection, how God 
And Jesus desired to have a relationship with all people. Even at this point, even the Gentiles. You see, Jesus right here, maybe in a very subtle way, He's pretty much saying the words that Paul will write later, that it is by grace that you are saved through faith. Not whether you're a Jew. Not whether you're a Gentile. No matter who you are, by grace, through faith, are you saved. And you know the rest of the verse. Not of works. Look at verse 14. Many others in Matthew chapter 8 here. It says, When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever and he touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and he carried our diseases. Here's the question I think that's raised. When we look at faith, is our faith such that we know God's power? Is our faith such that we know the Lord's compassion and the Lord's mercy? Is our faith such that we know that the Lord works all things together for our good? Is our faith such that we know that there is power in the very words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? So what prevents us, what stops us from wanting to experience that faith. What about faith? How does that relate to following? Look at verse 18. Matthew chapter 8. It says, When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. And a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And another disciple said to him, well, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Here we see, first of all, a teacher of the law. He is attracted to Jesus. He is already, in a sense, a follower of Jesus. Now, we're not told specifically, is he a true follower? In other words, wanting to have a relationship with Jesus has he come to believe in Jesus that he was the Messiah? Or is he just basically a follower of Jesus just more trying to learn how to be a better teacher? Since he's already a teacher of the law. Maybe he's already heard the teaching of Jesus and been amazed at his teaching. So maybe he's just following Jesus to pick up some tips. And maybe to learn from Jesus how to be a better teacher of the law. But anyway, he's got a desire. He's got this yearning desire to follow Jesus. And he says, Jesus, I will follow you anywhere. But just like I think of those people who may come forward and, and, and make a decision to follow Christ. But here's the situation. Following Christ is not just some passing fancy. Following Christ is not just some emotional spur of the moment decision. Following Christ is ultimately a surrender and a willingness to be transformed, to be changed. It's ultimately a completely new changed lifestyle. And it does come with a cost. But many people, they'll, they'll say, I want to follow Jesus. And they're willing to follow Jesus as Savior to get that ticket to heaven. But their lifestyle is not evident of following Jesus as Lord. You see the difference? See, following Jesus many times, it may not be comfortable. Following Jesus is not just a matter of convenience. But following Jesus requires daily surrender. All to Jesus, I surrender. That means a surrender of time. That means a surrender of routine. That means a surrender of life. 
That means a surrender of family. That means a surrender of friends. It even means a surrender of church. But most importantly, it means a surrender of self. Jesus said you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me daily. Not just follow me at one time when you walk the church of the aisle and you make a decision. So ask yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. How would you rate your level of surrender to Jesus Christ? Is he just your savior? Or is he also your Lord? Lord means you give him full and complete control of your life. So we've seen faith. Faith and that progression to following. What about fears? How is all that interconnected? Remember, Paul told Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Look at verse 23 in the 8th chapter. So then he, Jesus, got into the boat and his disciples followed him. And without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples went and he woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And so he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves. And it was completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves <laughs> obey him. Now what's interesting about this part of the story? Here Jesus is in the boat. And he's in the boat with his closest companions. These are his disciples. The one Jesus specifically went to early in his ministry. And chose them to minister alongside of him. And the other thing about this passage is that several of these disciples, what was their previous occupation? Fishermen. They were no stranger to the sea. So you would think that they were no strangers to any storms coming up on the sea. And they had witnessed. Jesus is healing. They've witnessed His power. They've seen the power in His words. And we're not even told in Scripture all of what His disciples, these closest companions of Jesus, we're not even told what they really, all that they might have seen and all they might have experienced. John even said toward the end of His Gospel, He said, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of His disciples which are not recorded in this book. And then in the 21st chapter of his same gospel, John said, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So we're told there, even in Scripture, we're not told all that his disciples, his closest companions might have seen and might have heard and might have experienced from Jesus. But what we see in this passage is the major reason for their fear in the storm was their little faith. Even though they might have been followers of Jesus, it was their faith that was small. See, God's in the boat with them. Lord's in the boat with them asleep. They yell out in fear, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. But don't miss this. The real danger in this passage is not drowning in the sea because of the storm. The real danger in this passage is drowning in fear because they're not clinging to that life ring, life preserver, if you will, whatever you call those rings that are on boats. They're not clinging to that life ring of faith in the Savior. And when we're not clinging to our Savior in faith, and in following and in surrender, then we take the chance of drowning in our fears, whatever they may be. And notice also, Jesus rebukes the disciple first. He says, you of little faith. But then he turns around and he rebukes the wind and the waves. Because, as we've seen earlier, there is power in the Lord's very words. And the disciples, it says the men were amazed. Who is this man? 
Even the winds and even the waves obey Him. So let me ask this question. Leave this thought with you this morning. When you examine and look at your own life, and your faith, do you see yourself more as the leper? Lord, if you are willing, I would be healed. Do you see yourself more as the centurion? Lord, I'm not even worthy of your grace. I'm not even worthy of your salvation. Lord, all you've got to do is just say the word. Or do you see yourself more as the disciples in the storm? Drowning in your fears. And what fears are you facing today? Are they fears at home? Are they fears at work? Are they fears in school? Are they fears at church? Some people just simply just fear any kind of a change. Have a hard time accepting change. Some people fear what God might be doing in their life and working in their life. What do you need this morning to let go of, to be fully and completely surrendered to Jesus as Savior and Lord? Is it a habit? Is it a relationship? Is it a lifestyle? Is it pride? Is it selfishness? Is it personal glory? Is it maybe just needing to reorder some priorities in your life? As 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Chris Tomlin, probably the most well-known, certainly most successful contemporary singer-songwriter today. If you listen to 101.3 on the radio and, and you listen to the Christian music there, many, many of those songs are probably not even aware are written by Chris Tom. But in his song, Our God, here, here are the words that he writes in that song. He sings in that song. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome, and power. Our God. Our God. And if God is for us, then who could ever stop us? If God is for us, who can stand against? You see, our God has not given us a spirit of fear, timidity. But He has given you and He has given me a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of self-discipline and sound judgment. See, that's the interconnection between faith and Christ as Lord and Savior. Following Christ in complete surrender every area of our life. And then facing our fears. Trusting God. I want to close the message this morning with this benediction. May your faith become strengthened. Resulting in you following Christ closer. And above everything else, leading you to overcome any fears through your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Let's pray.